thinking about the problem or the thing I'm, problems I'm going to talk about today. Um, <coughs> about four years ago, when I was here, <laughs> when I was busy meeting with my collaborators. Uh, okay, so um, I want to talk about linear equations and primes and their kind of mysterious connection to dynamics in nil manifolds and nilpotent groups. So here's the setting. So let P be the set of primes. And um, we consider the following question. So you look at a matrix A, a K by N matrix, integer matrix, and an uh, integer vector V. And you look at Y equals AX plus V. And you ask yourself uh, the following very basic question. Are there any integer values x or vector x so that um, y, ax plus b, all coordinates of y are prime? Okay? And if you, if you can find any one such, um, such vector x, well, how many can you find? And if, if you can find one, then you want to know how many of them, and you, can you get asymptotics? Okay, so uh, here's the basic case. So suppose k equals n equals 1, and you take the matrix A equals 1, and the vector V equals 0, then basically the question you're asking is, um, are there infinitely many primes? And uh, there are. So uh, it's the 2,000-year-old theorems by Euclid, so there are infinitely many primes, and, and took um, 2,000 years to, to actually get answer the second question, I find out asymptotic, so number of primes smaller or equal than n is roughly n over log n. This is independently by Hadamard and delavalle poussin Okay, so, so still in dimension 1, so k equals n is still 1, but we take y equals ax plus b, then, um, then we ask the question, are there infinitely many primes which are congruent to b mod a? Um, so are there infinitely many primes of the form y equals ax plus b, infinitely many primes in the arithmetic progression ax plus b? And the famous theorem of Dirichlet tells us that there are infinitely many such primes if and only if there are no local obstructions. There are no primes that divide both a and b. Okay? Um, right? So I wrote all down all his names because I got four. So I'm Tamar Deborah Ziegler Lehavi. He's got five, but, uh, okay. So, and, and, and the, combining the ideas of Dirichlet's theorem and the prime number theorem, ideas from the prime number theorem, we can get the prime number theorem in arithmetic progression that tells us that each legal arithmetic progression, there are phi of A legal arithmetic progressions, phi of Euler Torchian function, phi of A numbers that are um, uh, co-prime to A, uh, then each legal arithmetic progression gets its fair share. So the number of primes in each arithmetic progression is 1 over 5 of a times n over log n in, in an arithmetic progression. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go up in dimension. So take k equals 2 and n equals 1. Uh, then here is, here is a sample case. So look at y1, y2 equals, take the matrix 1, 1, x plus 0, 2. So this is x, x plus 2, and this basically asking, um, if we have infinitely many twin primes, okay, so this is a twin prime conjecture and no, no news in this front. Uh, okay, but, but let's, let's, go, um, let's go up in dimension, uh, look at this question. So suppose n equals 2 and take arbitrary k and look at this, look at the matrix, which is 1, 0, 1, 1, all the way through 1k and times xd plus the zero vector, then this is asking whether there is a k-term arithmetic progression of primes. Um, well, this is the famous Green-Tau theorem, 2004. So the primes contain inf arbitrary long arithmetic progressions. And you have to not confuse this with having infinitely many primes in, arithmetic in an arithmetic progression and having a long arithmetic progression of primes. Okay, so Dirichlet's theorem versus the Green-Tau theorem. And, and if, you, if you examine their proof, then it actually not only gives that they're, that they're um, uh, arbitrary long arithmetic progressions, but actually you get the correct order of magnitude of how many of them. So correct order of magnitude is n squared over constant times n squared over log n to the k, um, but, but it doesn't give the asymptotics. Okay, 
So, uh, so a couple of years after, after Green and Tao proved their theorem, they uh, published a paper uh, which I'll call the conditional multidimensional Dirichlet theorem, which says the following. So suppose you have the same setting as before. So you have a matrix A, integer matrix, and a vector V. And you assume this extra assumption that no two rows of A are linearly dependent. So the case I had, the case of, we had before of the 1-1, one, one, the twin, that gave us the twin prime question. Well, we rule this out. But, um, but only that. So suppose no two rows of A are linearly dependent, then um, Ax plus V is prime infinitely often if and only if there are no local obstructions. So I'll explain what this is in a minute. Um, and not only that, but, um, but one can actually calculate the asymptotics. So you, can, you have some number that is explicit, and you can calculate uh, the asymptotic number of solutions to Ax plus V prime. OK, so the only, well, there's a conditional in the name of, of the theorem. But this was conditioned on, on two conjectures that were labeled M and S and GIS, and, uh, which I will explain soon. But let me just say what lo no local obstructions means. Well, um, if, if, I can't, if, if I can't find an x such that all the coordinates of these are co-prime to p, then obviously I can't find infinitely many primes. So if there's no silly reason, okay, for, for th that, 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 that this thing can't, can't be prime, then, then this is one condition. And there's also the condition that the primes actually want to be positive, and since I just took an integer matrix, then I do want to have this matrix, this, this thing be positive infinitely, often. Okay, so as long as there's no, as there's no silly condition for this not to be true, then actually it is true, and one can actually calculate the asymptotic number. Um, once again, Two, two caveats. And one, one is this condition, this, this condition down here, and the second is this no two rows. Okay, so we, so uh, I think I even wrote it down over here. Um, I didn't write it. Well, what I wanted to say is that except for this two prime, the, the, the twin prime type case, except for the two rows that are linearly dependent, then everything else is covered by, by that theorem that I wrote before. Well, I'll repeat it again soon. But, um, but here's another remark on remark. Uh, so here's another remark. So you can rephrase this question in terms of solving, solving equations. And um, so, so you want to solve, e solve equations in, in prime variables. And, and the name of the game, the difficulty is, is the number of equations versus the number of variables. So for example, um, well, the more variables you have, the easier, the e the easier your task. Um, so for example, one equation in two variables, that's very difficult. This is like the twin prime case, so x1 minus x2 equals 2. Um, but if you, if you add a variable, so if you have one equation and three variables, then, um, for example, you can have a, a three-term arithmetic progression, which was proved by van der Korput. And uh, OK, what did I want to say? OK. And some special cases of, so, so this, this one equation and three variables, and, and in general, k equations with some special conditions using, well, I didn't say that before, so that's what I wanted to say. So I apologize. I'm a bit jet lagged, and <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll recap. Um, anyway, um, this, these results over here was used, this result of it over here was used, um, proved uh, using the hardy Littlewood circle method. And, and there are some special cases of k equations and fk variables that can also be proved in using the hardy littlewood circle method and was proved by Balog in 1992, basically sort of pushing whatever the circle method can give. But now we know that the circle method can't answer the question in general. And um, this, is, this is what I will speak about soon. Um, but here is, here is maybe a last case. So two equations and four variables that's a uh, four-term arithmetic progression. And um, so cover, it's covered by the green tau theorem, but they actually had a stronger theorem that follows from, uh, in which they, managed, they could verify the two, the two conjectures that I wrote before. So two equations and four variables, actually green tau theorem, even for asymptotics. OK, so, um, so here is what I said. I would write it again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So general, in general, what, what one wants to have, so this is the condition of, of not having two rows that are dependent, is having 
two more variables than the number of equations you start out with, without any degeneracies. Of course, you can hide a twin prime problem in there, and then, and then you cheat. But if you don't cheat, then, then basically um, you can solve anything that gives you two more uh, parameters than the number of equations. Uh, and this is what this says here. Okay, so the best possible dependence, excluding twin prime type case. One equation, okay, <laughs> okay, right, okay, fine. Um, so so um, one more thing about this theorem is that um, if, you wanna, if you wanna calculate asymptotics and if you wanna deal with this general question, then, then why the, the original methods that were used by Green and Tao are not sufficient and for, for well, the two obstacles. Well, one obstacle, well, the main obstacle is that they use this theorem, which is called Semiradi's theorem, which is true for any subset of positive density inside a set of integers. And Semiradi's theorem is not true for um, non-homogeneous equations. So if I, ha if I have this V here, then that doesn't hold. And the second problem is that it doesn't give any asymptotics. It can't, hopefully. It, can't, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any hope of giving any asymptotics. So if you want, so there are two, there are two problems with with this approach to getting that, and one is, one is that you're asking for non-homogeneous equations, and the second is that you actually want to get asymptotics. Okay. All right, so uh, ah, I think there's, there's an M here. So what is, uh, what is uh, M and S? So I want to describe these two conjectures to you. So M and S, this is the Mobius nil sequence conjecture. And uh, it says the following. Well, consider the Mobius function. So this is the function that u of n takes the value minus 1 to the k if n is a pro product of k distinct primes and 0 otherwise. And um, well, it's related to the, prime, to the primes by, by its relation to the prime counting function, uh, the von Mungold function lambda of n, which I'll describe later. Um, using, uh, using the Mobius inversion formula, but that doesn't matter for us at this moment. Um, here's what we know about the Mobius function. Well, it, it's known that it fluctuates. Okay, so you see this picture here of the Mobius function. So it fluctuates between 0, 1, and minus 1. And um, it's a classical theorem that if you look at the sum, you, that you have some cancellation summing up the Mobius function. So if you sum up the Mobius function up to n, so this this notation here means that it's smaller than a constant depending on a times whatever you have here. So you get, well, the trivial bound is n over here. And if you sum, and, and what, what, what you, the cancellation that you get is um, power log n cancellation. Okay? So actually, if, if you just demand that you want little low of n over here, then this is equivalent to the prime number theorem. And if you demand, if you want to have, um, very good cancellation. If you want to think of the Mobius function as a random function taking plus and minus one, then you would expect square root cancellation. And almost or essentially square root cancellation is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. So, um, so, okay. So there's this general principle regarding the Mobius function is that it's supposed to be behave in a sense like a random function. A random function is supposed to be orthogonal to anything that, well, in Hebrew you say anything that moves or anything that's structured. Um, so you can view this, this theorem over here as the Möbius function that is orthogonal to the function 1, to the constant function 1. Okay, so the Möbius function is asymptotically orthogonal to the constant function 1. And, uh, and there is a classical theorem of Davenport that tells you that actually, so, so here's a structured function. Look at the function, the exponential e to the 2 pi i n alpha. So this is a, a function with a linear exponential. Um, and, and this theorem of Davenport says that the Möbius function is orthogonal to this type of function, to this type of function, linear exponential function. And it's the same type of cancellation you can get. Uh, and using the same, the same method, you can show that for any polynomial, if you put instead of n alpha over there, any polynomial, then you still get the same, the same cancellation. Power of the log, is that arbitrary? To make that yeah, so this is the constant here. So for any a, you have a constant depending on a. Yeah. Um, right. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's 
sorry. Uh, okay. So we'll see that for our purposes, we need something more than that. We don't need the Mobius function to be orthogonal just to these nice, I'll call them polynomial phase functions. So it's a polynomial, but it's in the phase. So polynomial phase function. So we don't need it to be orthogonal just to the polynomial phase functions, but actually we'll need to have estimate related to different kind of polynomials that I'll call bracket polynomials. So what is a bracket polynomial? Well, you allow yourself to do anything you want with a regular polynomial, so add and multiply, but you also insert these um, brackets, which are uh, fractional parts. So bracket over there is the fractional part of n beta. Okay, so, so you can add as many, you can add, multiply, and add as many fractional parts as you wish. Okay, and so what does the Möbius null sequence conjecture say? Well, it says that for any bracket polynomial p, um, you have the same kind of cancellation. So the Möbius function is orthogonal to a bracket polynomial phase function with the same, with the same kind of cancellation. And so, so I'll, I'll refer to this as the Möbius function doesn't correlate with bracket polynomial phase functions. Okay, so, um, so I still owe you what is S and why is this nil sequence? And the only thing I can say now is wait, so I'll, I, I will explain that later. Um, but the, the good news is, is that this theorem is, was proved by Green and Tau in 2007, so the Möbius nil, sec, nil sequence conjecture is true. Okay, uh, right. So what is, what is GIS? So it's definitely cut off there. So what is, what is the GIS? So it's, it stands for the inverse conjecture of the Gower's norm of the U S plus one Gower's norm. And, um, and it says the following. So what are Gower's norms? Well, consider the group, this ZN, Z mod NZ, and look at a function F from ZN to the D will denote the unit disk. So it's a bounded complex function. And for any such function, for any abelian group, it doesn't have to be on Zn, but for any, abel for, 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 um, any such function on an abelian group, you can define discrete differentiation. So what is discrete differentiation? Well, you pick an element h in your group, and you differentiate in direction h this function f. So this is f of n plus h times f of n bar. So you can ask why am I not taking f of n inverse, but I want to rule out, I don't want to get in trouble with zeros. So this is, this is a good definition. Um, so, and this behaves very well, it behaves like a derivative. So here's an example. So suppose you know that, that your discrete derivative is the constant function one for all directions h and zn. Well, this will happen if and only if your function f is constant. Easy to see. Well, if you substitute h equals zero there, then you see that your function takes values in the unit circle. And then you find, then you can, then you can move this f of n to the other side and you find that f of n plus h equals f of n for every h. So your function is constant. So, so if your derivative is trivial, then your function is constant. And similarly, well, the same as you do with any polynomial. Well, this is, this is the same way you prove anything as a polynomial. So if you know that the, when the derivative is trivial, then you're a constant function, then immediately you can get that if your second derivative is trivial, then your function um, is a linear phase polynomial. And, uh, and in general, if you have, if, you're, if your k derivatives, if you take a function and you take the k derivatives and you, and, and you get something trivial, then your function is a linear poly, a, a polynomial, k minus one degree polynomial phase function, or the correct degree, as in polynomials, okay? Um, so, so what does that have to do with Gower's norms? Well, what does the Gower's norm do? So you take this function f from the zn to the unit disk, and you take all these derivatives in directions h1 through hs, you average over all of them and over n, you normalize correctly, and, um, and that's it. So you have one number taken from all these directional derivatives. Okay, and this is the Gower's norm. So it turns out to be a norm. And for s equal for s greater than one. And so, so here, here are some good properties of this norm. So 
Here's, I wrote the definition again, so you don't get lost. Okay, so I take all these directional derivatives and I average over all of them. Okay, so what, what happens, for example, if this number turns out to be one? Well, if this number is one, since my function was bounded by one, that means that all the summons are one. And if all the summons are one, then my derivatives are trivial for all, for all choices. So my function is actually a phase polynomial of degree smaller than s. So if this is exactly one, then, then I, I, I've found a way to, of, of asserting that this thing is a polynomial, that this function is a phase polynomial. Um, and conversely, well, if your function is a phase polynomial, then clearly all these derivatives are one, and then you get your Gower's norm is one. Okay. Um, but here's something that is a, list, a bit less trivial. Suppose your function correlates with a phase polynomial of degree smaller than s. Okay, so correlates in the same sense that we had before. So if your function correlates with a phase polynomial, then using Cauchy-Schwarz, you can show that you can, you can sort of get, get, rid of your, get rid of your polynomial phase function and, and show that your Gower's norm, uh, the, function, the Gower's norm of the function is, so this notation here says bounded away from zero. Okay, it's independent of n. So it just depends on the correlation estimate that you have over here. Okay, so if you correlate with a polynomial phase function, then you have large Gower's norm. And here's the last, a last thing we want to remember about this, this Gower's norm is that if your function is a random function, so suppose you were to flip a coin between one and minus one for your function. So, so flip a coin on each integer and decide with, and, and with the probability half put a one or a minus one. Then it's easy to show that then your Gower's norm for almost every func such function, your Gower's norm is going to be small. So random function has small Gower's norm, and if you correlate, if you have some kind of polynomial behavior, you correlate with the polynomial, then you have large Gower's norm. So here, <laughs> this is what you should remember. If you correlate with the polynomial phase function, large Gower's norm. If you're random, small Gower's norm. And, and here's the inverse question. Well, um, what, can, you, can you invert this? What can you say about a function if you know that the Gower's norm is bounded away from zero? So think of n as being very large, and this is bounded by some number, bounded away from zero. OK, so, so here's, the, here's the obvious question. If you correlate with a polynomial phase function, then you get large Gower's norm. Is it true that if you correlate, if, if your Gower's norm is large, do you correlate with a polynomial phase function? OK, so I'll get back to this question. Um, but before, I, I, before I, we get back to this question, I want to explain um, why, why they're interesting. So why, why would you be interested in Gower's norms? Or, and, and also, and how does this relate to these linear equations that we're talking about? Well, why they're interesting, they're interesting intrinsically. It's some number that captures some kind of polynomial behavior, and you're trying to understand whether lo some kind of local polynomial behavior implies some kind of global polynomial behavior. So, so they're interesting intrinsically, but they're also very interesting in the context of linear equations. And, and here's, a, here's a, so let's start with the simplest case we, we, we can think of. So, so think of the case of three term progressions. Okay, suppose you have some set, forget the primes, you have some set of, some subset of integers, E, and of size delta n, okay? And you want to try to count three term progressions inside your set E. So what do you do? Well, you look at the characteristic function of the set, one x, and, and you look at the counting expression. So you go over all x and d, and you look at x, x plus d, x plus 2d. This counts, well, there are some, some, some we're counting some non, maybe non-legal uh, non arithmetic progressions, but forget about that, okay? So, so, so this, is a, this, is, this is counting the number of arithmetic progressions of length three inside e, okay? Okay, um, so here is, here is an observation of Gower's, is that suppose you knew that your u2, so this is the number two here, so that your u2 norm, your Gower's u2 norm of the balanced function, so what is one e minus delta? So you look at the characteristic function and you subtract the integral. Okay, so what is the integral? The sum, the average of the function one e. It's delta because the, si the set was of size delta n. So I, I, this function it's, is a function whose average is zero. 
Okay? So if, what, if, what can you say? Suppose you know that, um, that the Gower's norm of 1 e minus delta is small, then this number of arithmetic progressions is roughly the number of arithmetic progressions you would get if you were looking for an arithmetic progressions in a random set of size delta n. So suppose you, had, you look at the numbers 1 through n, and you choose an element to be in the set with probability delta, then the number of three-term arithmetic progressions you expect is delta cubed n squared. And what this says over here is that if your u2 norm is small, then you imitate this randomness. You, you're, if you're just interested in three-term progressions, then you might as well be in a random set. Okay? This is, this is the meaning of, of this thing over here. Um, okay, so, so this is what I wrote. This is the number of three-term progressions we expect to find in a random subset of Cn of the same size, delta n. And what would be the same if the all Fourier coefficients of this are small? Yeah, that's the same as u2, but um, so uh, we will get to it. Yeah, I'm just explaining why, why, why they are related to, uh, to linear equations. I didn't say anything about what are these, what can you say about these norms. Um, okay, so, so here is what, it, what this says that if 1 e minus delta has small u2 norm, then 3 term progressions is like in a random set. And there's a similar relation between the s, us norm and s plus 1 term arithmetic progressions. So if I know that 1 e minus delta, the us norm is small, then this implies that the number of s plus 1 arithmetic term arithmetic progressions is like what I would expect in a random set, which I calculated for you here. So it's delta to the s plus 1 n squared. So this counts s plus 1 term arithmetic progressions. Um, OK. And, and even more generally, here's back to the context we had before. Suppose you have this matrix, k by n matrix, integer value matrix, and you have this vector y, a, x plus b. And suppose you know that no two rows of a are linearly dependent. That's where this condition comes in. Then there is some integer s, so that if you know that 1 e minus delta, the us norm of that is small, then the number of solutions you expect to find in the set e is as you would expect to find in a random set. OK? So this, this number s comes out of kind of a, uh, well, you take this expression over here and you Cauchy-Schwartz it to death. And then some, some Gower's norm comes out at the end. And, and this, is, this is the S that you use. Um, right. OK. And, and, but you can't do that. If you, if you have this, if you have this two dependence, this two row dependence, then you're missing, if you're missing this one extra variable, then, then you have no, no beginning of procedure. You, have, you can't start your Cauchy-Schwartz procedure. So this is where the condition comes in. OK. So, so, so you see, it's really, it's really important to try to find a, a, find a way to test whether your Gower's norm of some function, whether a Gower's norm is small. If I know that a Gower's norm is small, then I can easily solve linear equations. So, so this, is, this, is, this brings us back to this question. So this is the inverse question. You know, what can you say about a function f? If you, well, how can you test whether it's small? Well, what can you say if it's large? Can you say something about the function if it's the Gower's norm is not is large, bounded away from zero. This is the inverse question. So, so, so let's try to test some test cases. So if s equals zero, then this is the u1. It's not a norm. It's a semi-norm. But, but it's very easy to see that if, the, if you just write down the definition, it just says there that f correlates with a constant function. Its integral is large. So it correlates with its, its average is large. So it correlates with a constant function. So s equals zero checks out. And S equals 1, um, this is the u2 norm that we had before for three term progressions. So if s equals 1, then Fourier analysis. By Fourier analysis, one can find that f correlates with a character. Or a character is like a linear phase function. So if s equals 1, then this also checks out. So 0, 1, infinity. Um, so you might be tempted to think that inductively, well, if, if you're s plus 1 norm is large, and f correlates with a degree smaller than s phase polynomial. 
So we, we, I'm just reminding you, the converse is true. If you correlate with one of these, then you get large Gower's norm. So, but, but this turns out to be false. So, so here's a counterexample. So it's essentially due to Furstenberg and Weiss in a completely different context, but okay. So, so take the group G to be the Heisenberg group. So this is um, one, one on the diagonal and R over the diagonal, and take gamma to be the Z points of the group G. So this is a discrete subgroup of G. And so here are some facts about G. Well, G is a two-step nilpotent Lie group. Well, its double commutator is one. If you commute two elements of G, you get an element in the, in the very upper corner, and, and that commutes with everybody else. And um, gamma is a lattice in G, and G mod gamma, we call it a nil manifold, or in this case, a two-step nil manifold. So topologically, it looks like, well, on, on the diagonal over there, on the, the, on the second diagonal, over the ones, if you mod out by the Zs, you get a two-dimensional torus. And over each one of them, you have a circle. So it's a circle bundle over a torus. This is just a picture that has nothing to do with what. Well, it's nice to have a picture in, in a talk. So um, anyway, so, so I want to give you a counterexample. So, so I have to find, I have to somehow construct a function that has um, a large u. Well, we know that u2 is fine. So I need to find a function that has large u3 norm but doesn't correlate with any polynomial phase function. This is what I need, okay? So I take an element x inside my nil manifold, g mod gamma, and I look at this function, f of x, which is e to the 2 pi i, z minus, so this, you see this, this bracket comes in, so bracket x, y, and it's, it's an easy exercise to see that this function is well-defined on the quotient space. Okay, so I take this function, and I pick some element of the group, A, and I look at this function G, which evaluates G at the point N is this function F that I had before, evaluated at the orbit of the coset gamma under the action of A to the N, or the action of the group Z, if you want. So I look at F of A to the N gamma, so this is the function F on the orbit on the orbit of gamma under the action of A. And um, so this is what this turns out to be. So if you calculate it, it's an easy calculation. So it turns out to be, you get this bracket N alpha N beta and N choose two alpha beta. So you see where the brackets come in. Um, and okay, so this is a calculation. It's not trivial, but, but it's not very difficult. So this function has sufficient polynomial behavior to give you large Gower's norm. Okay, so there's sufficient polynomial behavior. It's not exactly polynomial because these things are, the brackets are not linear. You can't open them up. So it's not exactly a polynomial, but it has sufficient polynomial behavior to ensure that you have large Gower's norm. But if you choose alpha and beta to be irrational, then G doesn't correlate with any polynomial, with any quadratic phase function, actually any polynomial phase function. Okay, so this is, this is a, tr a true different object than, than polynomial phase functions. Um, okay, so, so here is, uh, so, so look at this function g of n. Well, this is an example of what we call a two-step nil sequence. So two-step comes for the two-step nil potent group and sequence because it's a sequence, so it's a, and nil is nil potent, so two-step nil sequence. And, and in general, if you have a, a, an s-step nil potent Lie group and gamma a lattice and g, and an s-step nil potent Lie group and gamma a lattice and g, and f is some nice function, so nice can be, in, you can define in various ways depending on how, wh whatever you're trying to calculate. And, um, and you fix some element a in g, and you look at the sequence g of n, which is f of a to the n gamma, so this is the orbit. So this is an s-step, we call this an s-step nil sequence. Okay? So now here is the inverse conjecture. Okay, sorry. So <laughs> this is probably what I was going to say later. So the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norm 
well, that's sort of, okay, sorry. The inverse, the, this is a new sentence. Uh, the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norm tell, asserts that th these nil sequences are the only obstructions to uniformity. This is the only problem you have to having Gower's uniformity. So polynomial phase functions are not enough, but, um, but these nil sequences are. So here is, here is the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norm. Well, if you have a function f, again, from Zn to a bounded function to the unit disk, and you have a large Gower's, then f has large Gower's norm, if and only if f correlates with some bounded complexity. So this has to do with the niceness of your function and the bound on your, nil, on your manifold. And um, so bounded complexity, s-step nil sequence. And it's an if and only if. So first of all, if you have one of these bounded complexity, s-step nil sequences, then you can, they, they're, they're, they have sufficient polynomial behavior to give you large Gower's norm. But also, the, but the inverse conjecture is that the other direction, the, the difficult direction, is true as well. So if this is the only obstruction you have to, to not being, not being Gower's uniform. Um, and, and this is just a remark that polynomial phase functions are only a small subset of this, this class of functions. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so, um, so how am I supposed to, what, when did I, ah, okay, I have plenty of time. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so, so what about supporting evidence for this, this conjecture? Well, for s equals 2, then it's um, a the result of Green and Town 2005, and this what led to the two equations, and four equation, two equations and four variables that I talked about before. Um, if, if your Gower's norm is sufficiently close to 1, then, um, then the conjecture is true, uh, this by a result of uh, Alon, Kaufmann, Krivilevich, Litzin, and Ron from 2005. Basically, if you're very close to, if, if your Gower's norm is, well, we said if it's exactly one, then your function is a polynomial phase function. If it's close to one, then there is a good guess of which, 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 what, what your, what your, how, which, which polynomial phase function you're supposed to be close to. And if you guess intelligently, then, then you, can show, you can show this. Um, and there is a related to, you can define these, these norms or semi-norms in, in the ergodic context, and there is a related ergodic theoretic result that is true um, due to host and crime, 2002. So, so, has nothing to do, no, 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 but I'm just, it has nothing to do with this, but it only, what, what it, but, but you know, philosophically it tells you that you want to believe that something like this. No, it has nothing to do with this. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with that. Um, so you can you can phrase. Well, I said at the beginning, you can define these Gower's norms in any abelian group, and um, specifically, you can try to find the finite field analog for this. So you look at the group f p to the n. So you fix the prime p, and you look at n being very large, and you can ask the question there. Well, it's 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 a good model for many questions. For if you want to try to understand some questions about the integers, it's very natural to try to first understand it in the finite field geometry, in this geometry over here. And um, so here are, uh, um, well, if s equals 2, then this is a result of green and tau for p greater than 2 in, in the same paper that the one above, and the result of uh, Samoodnitsky in the case of p equals 2. Um, but for s, for s greater than 2, um, there's a counterexample. And it was given by Green and Tao and independently by Lovit, Mishulam, and Smolodinsky in 2007. And, and actually, around that time, well, Roy Mishulam is in my, my department as a technician, and, and we were talking. He, the impression was, you know, maybe, maybe this is false. It could be. It, it, does, there, it could just be false. So some things break down after. Um, you know, one, one, one is abelian and two is, there's this new structure, two, u2 is, 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 is this um, linear phase functions, Fourier analysis, and three comes this nilpotent structure. And maybe, you know, maybe when you go up in, in, in degree, then, then things just break down and, you know, there's some, some more complicated, very complicated structures that come, come in the picture. Um, so, uh, so the good news is that, uh, that it is true, so the theorem, uh, um, so the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norm is true, 
And, um, and it follows that, that the, this theorem that I told you at the beginning, well, it's no, it's no longer conditional. So the conditional multidimensional Dirichlet theorem is no longer conditional. For example, um, you can calculate the asymptotic number of k-term arithmetic progressions. So that's covered by this. This, this is, this is uh, covered by the matrix that I showed at the beginning, 1, 0 through 1k. Um, OK, so, um, so I want to spend the rest of the time, or, or well, it's trying to piece up the pieces together for you and try to show you how these two conjectures fit inside proving this, this theorem about um, linear equations. So, so here is a, a different formulation of the Möbius nil sequence theorem. So the Möbius function doesn't correlate with bounded complexity nil sequences. This is what I said. So I'm just divided by the n over here to show to, this is the saying before I wrote it as smaller than n times log over. I, I divided both sides by n. So this tells you that the Möbius function doesn't correlate with, with nil sequences. <coughs> So this is one thing, and, um, and the inverse theorem for the Gower's norm tells you that you're bounded away from zero if and only if you correlate with one of these creatures, this S-step nil sequences. So if you just take these two together, then automatically you get that the U-S or any, the, the Gower's norm any, for any S, the U-S plus one norm of the, of the Möbius function is small asymptotically zero. So for example, if you were to count, um, I don't know, four term progressions or solve any linear equations that have to do with the Möbius function, this, is the, this gives you a little low of one. So you get it's asymptotically zero. But, um, but we wanted the primes. We didn't, we didn't want the, the Möbius function. So, so how, do, how does one go about proving this for the primes? OK, so you look at the von Mungold function. This is lambda n. So it takes the value log p if n is a power of p and 0 otherwise. So it's like the, it takes peaks on the primes and o over pro powers of primes as well. But we don't, those are very sparse. So we don't care about that. And, um, and re so remember what we're trying to count. We're trying to count prime solutions to Ax plus b. We're trying to make Ax plus b prime for a in matrix and, and, and integer matrix. So it would be really great if we could show that the Gower's norm of the, the difference, the von Mungold function minus 1, is small. Because if we could do that, then the number of solution we would expect to find here. So we, this is counting how many y1 if this is prime only if this is this this is non-zero the expression over here only if y1 is prime or power of prime and through yk they're all prime so this is exactly counting solutions for what i want okay so this is the counting expression and if i know that my gower's norm is small then this this counting expression should be the same as this is delta delta is one in this case okay so this should be like one times n to the n uh, which is what we would expect if we were counting solutions for a random von Mungold function. So this, if we could do this, this, this would be great. Um, but this is, this is not true. So it's not, it's not as straightforward. Um, uh, so, so, but there is a fix. So the problem is, the problem is that the small primes, the, they, they destroy the uniformity of the Gower's norm. But there is a fix to that. If you look, instead of looking at the von Mungold function on all integers, you look at the von Mungold functions on arithmetic progressions of um, growing gap, but growing very slowly. So you control, you just need it to grow as slow as you want, but grow to infinity. So you look at this modified von Mungold function. So the, 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 the constant that comes, so you look at the von Mungold function on an arithmetic progression of gap w. And you, you, you normalize it correctly so that the average is going to be 1. And where this w is the product of all small primes that are, sm all, all primes that are smaller than some fixed w. But this w grows very, very slowly to infinity. OK? So, so now, uh, so yeah, and the normalization is so that this average is going to be 1. And um, so your strategy now is to show that when this b, when you are an illegal, well, you have to be, you have to be um, a legal progression. So when you are 
co prime to w, then this modified function would have minus one would have small Gower's norm. Okay, so it will have small the going to infinity here is also also reflects what happens to this 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 gap in the arithmetic progression. But this you're allowed to take as slow as you want. Okay. So if you can do that, then what you would get is that you, you can you can you can count solutions here. So in order to get the correct number of or in order to get the, the correct approximation for the primes themselves. You need a fix. You need to understand what happens in the small prime, and that's the calculation that you do. This is the, the explicit constant that you get. Okay. So, um, so, so, what do you need to do? Well, well, you need to do. You need to show that the inverse, that the Gower's norm of something is small. Well, by the inverse theorem, what you need to do is to check that this function lambda b w minus one doesn't correlate with an ill sequence. Okay, but this through the Mobius inversion formula follows from the Mobius null sequence theorem. Okay, so I want to show that the Gower's norm is small. Inverse theorem tells me that I need to check it against null sequences and Mobius null sequence conjecture or theorem tells me that um, I, I'm orthogonal to, this, to these uh, uh, null sequences. So together, together this gives the theorem for the primes. So, so there's a cheat, <laughs> okay? Um, well, I, I told you this, this, whole, this whole theory of, of Gower's norm that works for bounded functions. So the functions f take value in, if, if you, if, I could cheat this way through and then say that the theorem for the primes follows from Semiradi's theorem in the, same, in the same way, because the pr problem is that the function is not, is not bounded. And um, okay, so that's, it's, a, it's not a small cheat. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's so it's it's not a it's not a small cheat, but it's a, it's fixable, and it's fixable to the rescue. So it's fixable using the original Green Tau paper. So if you take the strategy, the the, the machinery that is developed in the original Green Tau theorem for pushing. Th so there, you, if if you forget the question over there, so their theorem, their what what their their strategy over there is to show they they take a theorem that is true for sets of positive density inside the integers. And they push it to the primes, which are of positive density inside a pseudo-random set. So they, 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 have, they have this machinery that allows them to push theorems that are true for bounded functions to this formungled function, which is not bounded. So you take that machinery and you push it inside this theorem over here, then you get the same, the same theorem holding for, for, um, for th these functions lambda bw. Um, okay, so so let me just finish with a with a few remarks. So um, so first of all, uh, the finite field analog is well. I wrote that it was it was um, there was a counterexample, but um, but actually that's fixable. So if you change the conjecture a little bit, the, the original conjecture for the for the Gower's norm in in the finite field case was for in, 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 of a specific form, and if you modify it, then then it's actually it actually is true. Um, so this is this is a result with Bergelson and Tao and Tao and myself. And so this was we, we showed it. So it's, it's it's a different strategy and well not a different strategy, but it's there is a, additional difficulty in the case of of small characteristics. So this was in the in high characteristic first, and then in the second the second the the in the low characteristic as well. And and the second remark or maybe third is that um, well we're not. We're still not uh, understanding these Gower's norms very well, so there's still a lot of work to do there. And um, well, there is a, an alternative strategy towards the inverse conjecture that is being developed by Balish Segedi through measure measure theory on ultra products and cubic complexes. And um, there are many questions with whether we have both our our approach and Segedi's approach um, provide no quantitative bounds. So there are many more things that need to be understood in this context over here. And um, so this is many more research problems here. And I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> No, 
No, I don't think so. so okay, so, so Furstenberg, Furstenberg has uh, a structure. So he proved Stemmeretti's. So, okay. Um, Furstenberg proved Stemmeretti's theorem through a structure theorem of measure preserving systems. And his structure theorem is not, for, for, for his purposes, he didn't need an exact structure theorem. He needed some structures so that he, he can, um, could get nice recurrence properties. So this is what he did. And later it was uh, both, um, well, he came up, maybe I, I, it's difficult to say without. So he was studying these averages of these forms. Say here is, here is a raw, here is a three term progression average. So he was studying these averages are related to three term progressions. And for his purposes, he just needed to know that some average is positive. So he didn't need to know an asymptotic. He didn't need to know asymptotics. He just wanted to show that something is positive in the same sense that Semmerati's theorem works. And, um, and later, there was work by Kahn's and Lucene and work by Furstenberg and Weiss that discovered that if you try to understand, so if you try to understand this, this question of three term progressions, that's like the U2 norm. That's Fourier analysis and it's, it's, it's not difficult in the ergodic case as well. But if you go up to, to four term progressions, then this is the new difficulty that Gowers encounters in his proof, and it's a, it's a new difficulty that Semmeretti encountered in his proof. This, the new, first new difficulty comes, comes when you try to go from three term progressions to four term progressions. And they were studying these type of averages and discovered that two-step nil systems come in the picture when you try to understand these. And then there is a gap from, there's, there are two gaps in these problems. There's a gap going from Fourier analysis to two-step. This is the gap that was done by Furstenberg and Weiss and Kahn's and Lezine. And there is a second gap that comes from going from Three term for four term progressions to longer and any length progression, and the reason for the gap is that when you're working, when you're trying to understand four term progressions, then your base is abelian. Your base is the Fourier analysis that you had before, but when you go up, you, you, your base is no longer well behaved. You have some nil manifold, and that's not very well behaved. And and to, under, to, to do any analysis there, that increases the difficulty substantially. So that's the difficulty in, in all these things. There is difficulty going between, so also in the, in the Gower's norm, going from U2 to U3, that's one difficulty. And going from U3 to UK, that's the second. That's, that's, that's another difficulty. So I don't know, did I answer what you wanted to ask? I, I guess that lady mentioned the host crime work. Yeah. So this host in my work in ergodic theory and, and I'm talking about it, I'm just curious where the history of null manifolds. If you if you talk about the circle method, it's a circle. Or torus right. if you do several variables. But here, as you can as you explained, the, the null manifold is the most important thing. The question is historically how they came in. Ergodic theory. Ergodic theory, yeah. So it came in through these through these averages and Well, it's an if and only if theorem. So you can maybe describe, him in, describe them in a different way if you wish. But the theorem is an if and only if. If you correlate with a, with a, a nil sequence, then you have large Gower's norm and, and vice versa. It is a family of bounded complexity. Sorry? There is a bounded complexity that comes in one. Yes, but. For when you fix your when you fix your you have a, your problem comes with a delta right with 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 where you how how far you're away from zero that in anything but there's no nil manifold that you can throw off the list and say well it may not appear in 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 a specific instance when you uh, depending on your the dimension that's not going to depend on your delta that's not that's going to depend on on the on the your set of equations but there's no there's no one you can rule out. Hey, you can't say that that some some nil manifold, you know, is is uh, black sheep, and you know, it's not it's not it's, got, it's not in the sack, and and. Oh, but it could still be true that the theorem is true with just a smaller set of nil, man nil sequences in any way. No, because if you have a new one, I can show you that if you correlate with one of those, then. Maybe they correlate with each other. Some sets of nil sequences correlate with each other. 
uh, maybe I'm, uh, I'm not sure I understand what, then what you would say. So, some, some, so if I can find a, a kind of a nice set that the other sequences, are, well, I could do that, but that's, that, I don't think that would um, add information. So if you utilize theorem on primes in arithmetic progression, as a very useful generalization chapter of density theorem, is there anything similar to that here? I mean, chapter of density theorem, in classical theory is a very important thing, very good chapter. So again, so what? what, so what the question <laughs> is, is there any analogous thing happening in this kind of? I don't know. I'm not sure. Know, I mean, primes in arithmetic progression is what you started to look at. Yes, prime. So, so you're asking if there are nice applications or no, nice yes, generalizations? Nice, uh, for example, fields you have for uh, uh, like extensions, you have this chapter of density theorem. So, what would you? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not a number theorist, so I don't know what so, would be the. Well, 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 like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Terry did Gaussian. Uh, so, you know, one yes. Has, yes? But I think there's a very fundamental difference. The Dirichlet theorem is many generalizations. One that you're talking about, which is about reduction mod phi, yes. and objects reduced mod phi. You think of a prime reducing algebraic objects mod phi, and then you generalize. Yes. While here, you really are solving equations like for Ben Abrata. You're just asking which numbers are some of the three primes. Mm -hmm. It's not the most natural. Okay. One equation is three variables. May can do any number of equations as long as the number of variables is more than two, 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 two more, and it doesn't degenerate. But I think this is about the case when there are infinitely many solutions. I mean, in Vinogradov's case, there are finitely many no, solutions no. for the equation. No, no, that's just because uh, that's, I think, uh, people usually, that's because the n moves on the right. People quickly generalize to the general linear equation. So you, know, you can move the right-hand side in, and make the coefficients positive. They all work together. It's the difference between Goldbach and twin primes. Yeah. They will fall together. Yeah. But uh, does <laughs> this apply to that situation? No, that's one equation with two unknowns. Mm -hmm. Illegal, so far. <laughs> no, but Vinogradov is an equation with three unknowns. So does this imply Vinogradov? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 One, equa right. one equation, two variables. Uh, three. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, one equation, three variables.